Hello, everyone. Stop. OK, you're going to have to get better at that once the lightning talks start. So this is the last session of this year's linux.conf.au. And it says in the schedule that there are lightning talks now, but that's a slight lie, because we have a, a special thing to be presented uh, by uh, Rusty Russell and Pia Waugh. Please make them welcome. But uh, before we do the thing before we do the lightning talks, uh, Michael Davies wanted to come up and say one word. I believe. Oh. Stickers. stickers. <laughs> um, can we have that up on the screen for the moment? And the mic light. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Cool. LC hashtag LCA papers. So I was talking to Robert Collins uh, just before, and we thought, how are we going to find out what are the hot topics and what are the great speakers that we need to have at the next LCA? And we thought, how can we get that from you? How can we get that from you in the community? How in March, when you suddenly think of, man, I just need to know about TensorFlow, or in April, when you hear, man, I want to hear about um, blockchain. How do I do this, right? <laughs> how, do I, how do I let the papers committee know? And what you do is you do this. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I, I understand that. <laughs> but for this, I mean, you've got to remember, this was like 45 minutes ago. And so we decided that what we could do is just have a hashtag on Twitter. If you come up with a great idea that you want to see at the next LCA, just tweet with that hashtag, all right? So that we can know in the papers committee, this is what you want to see, and then we can try to get that speaker or that topic covered. So uh, do it, OK? If you want this conference to be awesome next year, then do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, okay, now. Uh, yeah, I'll just stand behind another break. <laughs> so, there is an award in this community for. <laughs> God, this is going to be long. <laughs> there is an award in this community for. Get, getting in and getting your hands dirty. When you see something that needs doing, the nature of volunteering means that you just get to do it yourself. And there are some people who do this repeatedly and set an example for all of us that inspires us. And the Rusty Wrench Award is all about people who do things all the time. <laughs> it turns out a side effect of having a group of people who are doing things all the time is they tend to be too busy to do things. Like, <laughs> organize the community nominations for this year's Rusty Wrench Award. <laughs> but we were battered by requests for a particular nomination uh, this year. Um, and so without further ado, we should fetch the thing, <laughs> the Rusty Wrench that is the auspicious award itself. Ooh. And this year, everyone was very clear that there was someone in our community who has done a great long service and deserves recognition, and their name is Michael. <laughs> Something may have been lost in translation, so. If, uh, unfortunately, Michael still had to fly away, but Michael Davies, <laughs> you get the actual wrench, and <laughs> Mr. Still gets the uh, platform. That's pretty nasty, you know, giving someone an award like that. Um, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of Michael and I, um, <laughs> um, yeah. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, 
So let me just say this. Um, I, uh, I was involved in this conference. So I went to Cayley, well, I went to the first one, and I remember hearing Rusty uh, plead. He came around to all the local lugs, and he pleaded, he says, please come to this conference, because I've bankrolled it myself, and I'm going to go bankrupt if I don't get it done. And I saw the passion in, in Rusty, right? I saw that passion. That was terror, but <laughs> yes, passion. <laughs> and so I figured, man, I, I want to do this, right? I want to I want to bring this conference to my hometown, Adelaide, and we did that in 2004, uh, which was fantastic. But then I thought, how can I continue to contribute? How can I continue to do something to help this awesome community that we're part of? And uh, the papers committee was the thing that I sort of chose um, because I felt it was something that I could contribute. I'm not the world's best coder and I'm not the, the world's best anything, but um, I sort of figured that uh, this is one way that I can do it, right? And so we've been doing it ever since. And uh, Michael's been doing it for almost as long. And that's because we just wanted to make this happen. And so I guess, uh, as well as saying thank you, I just want to challenge you all to contribute. Find your niche. Doesn't matter whether it's open hardware or documentation or working on the Linux kernel or writing some app and putting it up on GitHub or designing open hardware or something else. Just contribute. Find out where your niche is and contribute and make our community better. Open hardware. Uh, <laughs> open rusty hardware. Um, but. Seriously, everyone, like you have something to contribute to Linux Australia, and so uh, I, can, I just want to encourage you to do that. Find your niche, get involved, make a difference, okay? And that's what I just want to encourage you with. So thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Is that all you have, Rusty? Wonderful. Uh, I'd just like to echo the sentiment of that team. Uh, having been organizing in, in the organization process of this conference for a few years already now, um, the Michaels have been absolutely fantastic to work with, and it is um, a testament to uh, their stewardship of the Papers Committee uh, over the last few years that this conference has reached the absolutely high standard that it did this year. and. Uh, Basically, without their, uh, without their help, uh, I would have looked really bad because you wouldn't have any talks to see and you would have been here. And actually, there probably wouldn't have been any of you here. So, uh, so I wish to add my thanks to, uh, uh, to the thanks that everybody else has added. So now that that's done, it's time for the lightning talks, which are often my favorite part of the conference. Let's see if they are at the end of this. <laughs> so if you have not seen lightning talks before, they're five-minute talks on a topic of the presenter's choosing. We're going to make that five minutes very, very strict so that we can get through as many of them as possible and, um, and yeah, ex expose you to a really wide variety of, of interesting topics. Now, to make sure that we, um, that we don't waste any time, I'm going to train you in applauding. OK, so when we get to the... I need to keep my hands free, so yeah, this is all I have at the moment. You're no, 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 I'm fine. My pocket works fantastically and you can still hear me, right? Okay, so, whoa, maybe I do. <laughs> Get the shortest, <laughs> um, okay, so. Um, <laughs> stop. Good, you're really good at that. Okay, so when we get to the last two or three seconds, we don't want to interrupt them just yet, but we do want to give them an idea that we're sort of finishing time. So when I start doing this, you should start doing it. And if a lot of people applaud like this, you can start to hear it. Yes. And then when we hit five minutes, applaud and applaud and applaud loudly until I tell you to stop. Great. We're going to get along just fine. So up on deck on this side, uh, we have Martin Kraft, but first, Jack Skinner. Wonderful. Thank you very much. You're all part of an experiment today. Uh, on Tuesday night, I said, uh, lightning talks are fun, but karaoke's better. And long story short, I was told to do some lightning talk karaoke. And that's been a passion of mine for a little bit. Um, I really, really love doing lightning talk karaoke talks where I've never seen these slides before. <laughs> Which means this is exactly what this talk may end up being. It'll either be utterly brilliant or completely 
terrible, a complete car crash, you could say. Um, usually, I find these talks have a lot of puns in them. Um, and it's really difficult to get started with a talk because you don't know if you've got a story arc. You don't know if you've got a complete tangent in the next slide. <laughs> but whatever slide you do get, don't panic. <laughs> because I generally find the audience is with you. <laughs> so if you would join me. I, I feel like there's a circle around me right now. Um, but it's true, getting up and doing a talk on, on a topic you might not know very well but you want to learn more about is a fantastic <laughs> way to get into public speaking. It's a fantastic way to contribute your passion back to a community and an audience who are with you to learn. <laughs> if you feel like this when you've been invited to do a talk and you're going, oh, I'm panicking, I can't do that, someone will tell me I'm wrong. Pick three things that you know about, <laughs> that you are caring about, and that you know that you know them. And talk about that. <laughs> because if you overcomplicate anything, <laughs> then you will struggle. <laughs> because when you hit slight road bumps, when you, when you encounter a slide you don't know, you know your three things. <laughs> when you drill down on your topics and you, you look at what you want to communicate and articulate to an audience, um, <laughs> you'll slowly find that your knowledge grows on those topics over time. <laughs> which means your audience is probably also on that journey. I, I feel like these slides tell a story completely on their own. <laughs> if that story is being told, whatever happens along the way, you'll have the tools to deal with it. <laughs> Those tools are usually coffee. <laughs> now, if you don't have um, the right tools, there's a fantastic community around you to offer suggestions. You don't have to use every tool in your arsenal. And generally speaking, it is best not to use every tool in your arsenal. <laughs> you end up with slides like this. <laughs> Why exercise? Well, practice your talk. You've got the tools, you've got the community, you've got the knowledge and passion, so practice it. <laughs> or to put it another way, <laughs> once you exercise, you will generally find that this doesn't happen. <laughs> You'll find that your travel on your, your, your uh, talk, your journey, doesn't get uh, completely <laughs> derailed. <laughs> now, I once sat down with a, a grandmaster presenter, and they told me that by the age of 38, 70% of their brain was no longer thinking about talks. <laughs> and that they had instead <laughs> specialised in the design and construction of spam tins. <laughs> and so as you think about topics and you think about presenting, don't worry if your talk changes tangent. Just go with it and drop the mic. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Jack Skinner. So up on deck we have Peter Lawler, but first, Martin Craft. So I feel uh, greatly uh, empowered and uh, motivated to speak after Jack. Um, I also did not get a chance to study my slides and learn them by heart, so this was going to be karaoke as well, but that's a whole different meaning. So uh, bear with me, I'm Martin, I'm not an expert, and I'm not affiliated with but, because I'm very motivated to do so, for reasons that are non-commercial, more ideological, I'm here to talk to you about Matrix. Let's have a little show of hands. Who in this room, put your hands up if you've heard of Matrix. Okay, that is the vast majority. Um, leave your hands up, and those of you who are 
not yet running Matrix, not yet using it, put your hand down. Okay, that should be about 104. <laughs> matrix, not the matrix. <laughs> so matrix is an end-to-end -end encrypted federated ecosystem for open decentralized communication. I promise there will be more buzzword bingo later. Here's pretty much how it works. You have a couple of home servers. They're federated. They uh, sit out in the net. Clients connect to them and uh, communication flows between them. Application service, identity service, I'm probably not going to touch on today because I only have these five minutes. But uh, the important message here is that no single entity owns your conversations. The data are shared throughout the entire network, and therefore, you are not locked in. It is end-to-end -end encrypted, which seems to be the standard these days. Multi-device end-to-end encrypted, similar to what Signal does using the <laughs> old double ratchet. It's called Ohm double ratchet and the mega Ohm ratchet. Um, and the guys behind Matrix have uh, received funding from the Open Technology Fund to get the NCC Group Cryptography Services to assess the algorithm they're using. And they uh, chose to publish the assessment transparently in the open, found that it's pretty hardcore, as you can see down there. And you're invited to read the entire blog post about that. I've uh, included the short URL down here. It's also on the blog on the matrix.org website. One other cool thing about Matrix, and that's probably the reason why you've heard of it, is because you can use it to bridge between walled gardens. And so at this conference, a couple of us have unofficially set up Matrix to bridge between Slack and IRC to give a unified chat experience among those who chose either of these three tools. It works pretty much like that. You have these walled gardens out there. You have Matrix here, and then you bridge it. And this is where the application services come in. Now, it started out just a little more of a two years ago. And uh, if you've used it, you will probably have to agree that it's come a long way already. It's in very late beta, has 450,000 users on the single matrix.org home server. That's like Jabba.org. It's like one of the main ones to get people on. 104 are here. So thank you very much for that. 400,000 messages per day, 50,000 rooms, chat channels, or whatever you want to call it, federated service, 1,000, and 50 companies are actually already working on this. You can see down here the adoption curve, which has uh, skyrocketed in the last year. And uh, well, we're, we're up there now, and LCA is hopefully going to take it even further. It's an open, free ecosystem. That means if you don't like the main server that's out there that is free software, you can write your own. There are already three there. You can still write your own. You can use it to write services of your own if you don't like any of the IRC, Slack, Gitter, Rocket Chat, and so on that I've listed on there. Uh, if you find anything that you need, write the service for it. It is an open standard. You can use various clients, including the ones that are on here, or One you can minute. write your own. This is what the main client, the glossy one, looks like on Riot.im. And you can see it pretty much is similar to what we're used to, presence information on the right, chat, rich. It has media uploads. You can do voice and video calling. There's an Android app. iOS presumably looks very similar. And uh, here's the buzzword bingo that I promised. I don't think we have any time for questions. <laughs> or do we? Any questions? No questions. Everybody, please. I'm stand looking by. forward to your adoption. Thank you. So up on deck, on this side, we have Russell Keith McGee. But first, Peter Lawler. Thanks, Chris. Um, hi, I'm Pete. I'm a local here. And I'd like to talk a bit about my projects over the last year or so and experiments in uh, cooking stuff using open software and hardware. Um, first off, I'm a pastor Fari and I'm a registered minister, so if anyone needs a blessing, I'm more than happy to provide that to you. I'm also a self-identified pirate. You might remember in 2009 at the Penguin Dinner, I fell off the stage down there and busted my knee up. I finally had uh, surgery a couple of years ago, but I am aiming towards this body enhancement. Um, now, just a warning, I don't endorse anything in this presentation at all. Using electricity and liquids in close proximity to each other is for professionals and or idiots. And this is also an exercise in drunk programming. I was sick and tired of uh, not properly documenting stuff. 
And I decided that, well, if I'm drunk while I'm coding, I'll document it, and therefore I'll remember hopefully better the following morning, or curse myself for not remembering the following morning. Um, there's my drunk programmer hero, Father Jack from Father Ted. Um, so a bit of mathematics about uh, the system I'm using is uh, it's a proportional integral derivative controller or PID controller. And there's a whole bunch of words up there that I'm just going to skip through because I've got quite a few slides. And words, yeah, I just lose it about on the second line. There's a nice little, um, oh, hang on, we're going through that again. I don't know how that happened. There we go. There's a mathematical function which my brain just, eh. But there's something I can sort of follow here. There's some sort of feedback loop. So we get temperature in and adjust some, make some measurements, get the output of it. And this is where I started out in a, in a Arduino kit from Adafruit um, and a $20 Sunbeam rice cooker. And the general idea is vacuum seal some food, chuck it in the rice cooker and control the temperature to 60, 70 degrees um, while it cooks and you get lots of really tasty food out the other end. Um, but the, the Arduino had a poor UI, no network. I didn't own some of the specific hardware. It wasn't going to be difficult to scale. And um, I thought, well, I'll change it over to Raspberry Pi, but my Raspberry Pi kept crashing. Um, so I needed some other software, so I went looking for software. And I forgot to document why I chose the particular software I ended up with, um, which is a part of the problem of <laughs> drunk programming. So I ended up on the Beagle Bone Black, um, and here's my setup in my laundry. Um, I've got a little fish tank air pump in there just to help circulate the water around, and in the afternoon I can get a really nice steak out of it, and there's no wasted energy. Um, that's going off into the atmosphere, and that's really nice. But wait, there's more. We can do more stuff with it. Um, we can actually germinate seeds using this procedure by controlling a heat pad and keeping the soil nice and warm. Your happy seeds go um, start growing, particularly down here in Tasmania in winter. It's a bit tricky. And it's, um, cooking is less labour-intensive for testing this stuff out. Um, and you can just see up there the uh, heat pad. And growing plants is yay science. He's my famous scientist. Um, <laughs> but wait, there's more. Beer. I also use this system to brew beer with. And this is where the main talk from Taslug came earlier this year, uh, last year. Um, I can cook stuff where I know the ingredient provenance from it. It's open source cooking. Um, I only need to heat stuff up. I don't need to cool it down by doing ginger beer with beer. I don't need to cool stuff. And so apparently it's nice and simple. Um, my first brew, I used a whole bunch of stuff bought from a shop because I was trying to make things as easy as possible. So it was a ginger beer premix, and it tasted horrible. It really did. Um, so I then borrowed young Tim. Now, young Tim is from Taslug. He's also on the organising committee. He's younger than me, so he's young Tim. And you get some of this stuff, which is sugar, some ginger, um, mash it all together, add some chilli in because chilli ginger beer, and then you put it in a fermenter, and then you wait for a while. <laughs> and there's some nice graphs there, and you can see the things, uh, the, temp the desired temperature s slowly um, sitting around where I want to brew things from. And you also get weird memory errors on embedded systems <laughs> because there's no memory to do even prettier graphs. Um, and that's actually my SMS system that sends me a message when the brewing is dying. Yeah. And then you wait more, and then you drink it. Thanks. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. Just, uh, I, ho I hope that, uh, well, I ho hope that you haven't confused your washing machine and your cooking machine now while you've had it in the laundry. <laughs> All good. Twice. <laughs> Only twice. Um, so, uh, Mark Atwood is on deck over here, uh, but first, Russell Keith McGee. Well, oh, good afternoon class. I'm Dr. Russell Keith McGee. Uh, this is Emoji Archaeology 101. We have a lot of material to get through, so let's get right into it. Uh, in 1963, the human emotion of happiness was created. Uh, it, was, it was created by the American Harvey Ross Ball, who was employed to create an image of a happy face to raise the morale of the employees at an insurance company. 
But once people realized that it was possible to express emotions, they wanted to express emotions of their own. In a New York Times interview in April 1969, Vladimir Nabokov said, I often think there should exist a special typographical sign for a smile, some sort of concave mark, a supine round bracket. And then in 1982, Scott Farman had a breakthrough where he proposed the composition of three ASCII characters as a trigraph to express emotion, happiness. Although these code points don't in themselves represent an emotional context, if composed horizontally, they combine to produce a powerful expression which the user can comprehend simply by turning one's head 90 degrees to the left. <laughs> While happiness does have significant utility as an emotion, users felt it was not meeting all of their needs. Uh, however, by replacing the third code point, the much more functional emotion of unhappiness could be expressed. This ironically led to much higher levels of happiness because users were now able to voice displeasure at everybody who disagreed with them. <laughs> thus, thus began a pre-Cambrian explosion in the expression of emotion as users realized the hidden potential of the US ASCII code point set. The first changes were simple issues of ergonomics. By reversing the code point order, it was possible to evenly spread the physical exertion required to observe emotion. <laughs> Uh, more sophisticated extensions were then added, uh, and uh, ooh, a uh, adornment wearing glasses or an optical tiredness from staring deep into the ASCII code chart looking for emotional inspiration. <laughs> there was also a move to represent more extreme emotions, such as extreme happiness. But some expressions of extremists couldn't be embedded into three glyphs. They required the introduction of a fourth glyph to, for example, demonstrate scorn, or to embody a single tear rolling down the face. Some purists, however, felt that the three code point limit should be rigorously retained, so they compressed complex emotions, losing the fidelity of nasal expression. <laughs> Others freed themselves of any anary constraints, allowing for the rendition of, say, the absurdist philosopher Homer Simpson, <laughs> or the beneficent midwinter courier Santa Claus. Others revisited the premise that emotions had to be expressed horizontally and looked to the perpendicular as a presentation style. However, at this point, the ASCII US code set was reaching its limit. Uh, this led to the introduction of Unicode, providing vastly more alternatives with which to construct even deeper expressions of emotion. It's not clear from the literature uh, whether any of these glyphs are actually used in their languages of origin. Uh, the, the schism between minimalists and maximalists in the expression of emotion reached its zenith with this pair of expressions, an 11 character table flip as the ultimate expression of anger, and a single katakana as an expression of simple happiness. Unfortunately, more pressure was placed on the Unicode consortium to allow for more literal expressions of emotion. This started with simple renditions, but over time, these expressions became more and more literal, removing all subtlety and nuance, and, and indeed beauty from the process of emotional expression, perhaps best demonstrated by the introduction of the pile of poo symbol, allowing scatological references without the need to understand what scatological actually means. <laughs> this has been accompanied by a loss of agency. In the past, users could disruptively innovate and develop their own emotions. But like some sort of big brother, only those emotions approved by the Unicode consortium may now be expressed. It doesn't matter whether you like Manhattans. The consortium, the savage arbiter of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, has determined you shall not express these ideas. And no longer may we compose symbols to create new emotions. Only those compositions approved by the consortium are permitted. The modern One emoji minute. represents a significant loss to our collective culture. The ability to embody happiness in the eight bits of storage needed to display a right bracket. This, this is the essence of the human condition. This is who we are. We are not stardust. We are not the champions. We are not a number. We are emotions trapped in a brutal corporeal manifestation. So what are we to do? Some might call for emoji to be eliminated, to be struck from our collective history, but that would be defeat. No, we should fight for our emotions. So rise up, rise up my children, smash the control image, smash the control machine. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Do not be constrained by the limits placed upon you by the emoji consortium. Compose new emotions and express them, express them deeply and longingly and outwardly. And before someone asks, yes, this will be on the exam. <laughs>
How many of you think knows who runs the NTPSEC project? You're probably wrong. I do. <laughs> <laughs> NTPSEC's been running for a couple of years. The work started in late 2014. Um, we f did a hostile fork from the NTP Classic project, which still is somewhat sad, but had to be done, and did the conversion to Git, and that's about the time I got involved. We did the .9 release towards the end of 2015. We did the uh, .9, um, .9 .6 release towards the end of last year, and we are driving hard for a 1.0 release where I will be comp uh, more comfortable saying you should run this thing in production. Um, our size, this, this is the, um, the number I'm we're very proud of. Um, NTP Classic was 231 kilowatt lock. Um, we are down to 62 K lock, 73% removed. Yay. Yay. How did we do that? First of all, Python is a magical thing. Um, we replaced all the command line tools with Python. We replaced the build system, which was about 70,000 lines of autoconf. Everybody go, oh. <laughs> with um, Python and WAF. Um, and then the rest of it is in C. Um, we decided that it's 2016, 2017. Now C99 is every place. So we said C99 safe subset, POSIX1 is everywhere, um, and statint is a thing. Um, we removed the um, IFDES OS shims, OS shims. Um, NTP Classic had operating system shims for operating systems that have not booted since 1984. Um, we have UNT64T, um, the ERIT is um, backing up, is NTP Classic is probably the oldest chunk of code still running on the internet. It predates IPv4, so it also predates 32-bit um, ints, so 64-bit calculations were done in NTP using unions of structs and structs of unions and falsified adders. Whoa. Um, turns out that everything is POSIX. Every single machine that we have tried is POSIX enough, including Windows machines. Um, and we also removed a lot of experiments. NTP Classic was full of a lot of half-done experiments that never worked, and I'm thinking about writing a paper about that. One of the ways that Git has changed the world, when you're working on a neat project, you no longer have to keep it in the tip of the project, so you can always get access to it, you just do it in a separate branch. And we are still coming around to how that's changed things, and when you do archaeological redevelopment like this, you get it rubbed in your face how bad it was back then. So the real reason why I'm doing this is I want you to join us. Um, at the very least, download the project, compile it, see if it works on your machine, works in your environment, um, find bugs in our documentation, find bugs in our code, tell us what we got wrong, what we got right, what you want added back. Um, it's, we had some very good sessions at the Community Leadership Summit down under a couple of days ago where we had a um, panel on revitalizing a um, dead or dying community. And um, I took a lot, of th a lot from that and added a bunch of that because of my experience here. And the main thing that we focused on and I focused on is removing all the pain points that were driving away contributors. We use Git, not BitKeeper. Yes, BitKeeper. We use GitLab, not Bugzilla. It's we make the project fun, not painful. It is actually really kind of fun to be hacking around in pure Python and in pure C. It is extraordinarily painful to be dealing with C that where three quarters of it are operating system shims for operating systems you've never seen. One minute. And we've worked very hard to make our community welcoming and not angry. Sometimes it can be terse because we are full of time nerds and time nerds are very special people. Um, <laughs> But as long as, you're, as long as you're not late and your watch is correct, they like you. <laughs> we built a um, how-to step-by-step and uh, tried it out so even people who had never done soldering before can now build a Stratum 1 time server on a Raspberry Pi using a GNS receiver and NTP sec. Um, at the very least, give that a try. If you have a Raspberry Pi lying around, it's actually really kind of fun and easy to put a Stratum 1 server in the pools. Um, one fun thing why, NT, why LC is awesome is we moved the uh, Microsoft NTP feature because it um, was full of security problems. Um, we're adding it back because of a chance encounter here at LCA 2017 with a um, gentleman from Catalyst IT. The new one will be tested and to spec. We are grateful for grants and supports from. We would like grants and supports too. Okay. Thank you very much.
I s um, so, uh, on deck over here we have Rusty. Somehow he already knows that he's on deck, which is amazing. Um, but, uh, but first we have uh, Katie Bell, who's going to be telling us about something that's kind of close to my heart. <laughs> Would you mind, please? Okay, so who has questions about this picture? Yes, you might have some questions. Who is this guy? Well, he has a name tag, so that's handy. Um, but what is this thing strapped to his chest that looks kind of like an explosive device? What's this on his arm? Is that a blood pressure monitor? Where is he? So he's at the National Computer Science Summer School, which finished last week, so I'm sorry most of you missed it. Um, but it's also only for high school kids. Um, we get about 100 high school kids. It's run by the University of Sydney. It takes 10 days, and we teach them to program. Um, also, one of the alumni happens to be our glorious leader, if you can recognize a photo from 11 years ago. So it's been running a really long time. The camp has been running for 22 years. Half of the kids, um, nowadays we teach them, half of them web programming, we teach them Python um, and some web stuff, build social networking sites, apparently social networking sites are cool. Um, the other half of the kids, we do an embedded stream where we teach them embedded programming, and this was the first year we taught them Python as well using the BBC Microbit, which is this thing. It looks deceptively big in that photo because my hands are really small. But um, this is how easy it is to get started with the BBC Microbit. You write one line of Python and you can show pictures on the screen. It does cool things like radio between two different microbits is ridiculously simple. You can just, you know, radio.send a message and radio.receive a message. Um, but it has, you know, GPI opens where you can plug in whatever else you want. It has buttons, it has an accelerometer, um, and this opens up a world of possibilities for what you can do and a world of creativity for uh, students to explore. <laughs> So, for all of the embedded students, we gave them this challenge. Build some kind of challenge or game thing to encourage fitness and health. Um, this was interpreted more as uh, fun ways to torture the students from the web stream, who all got to try out all of the different uh, devices that they built. So, as an example, here are two micro bits strapped to someone's legs. Here's Jim again. Um, you had to hold up your legs. Um, and it would change to a smiley face and hold up your legs and hold them up higher um, and thus torture the web students. Um, here was a two-player game where you have an arm wrestle, but instead of trying to win the arm wrestle, you had to try and lean to your side, which made this robot on the ground go much faster. Uh, this is them starting. This is them in progress with the motion blur on the robot there. Um, so you don't actually want to win. You just want to keep it on your side until the robot reaches the end. This one is another motion blur example. Um, there was, what you can't see here is there's a micro bit strapped to that pillar on the wall. Uh, it's showing like a Flappy Bird game where you, you're a little character and there's like things that you have to duck to go under or jump to go over. Um, again, making you exercise. Uh, there's someone made, actually two different groups made a DDR game where you have panels on the floor that you have to press at certain times and a little display to tell you which way to go. Um, this one was kind of a simulated skiing game where you had to move your arms like this really fast. Um, and there's a row of NeoPixels on the side which would track your progress, lighting up funky colors. Um, this one was one of my favorites. Who here, like, knows a teenager? Yep. Who here has heard of dabbing? Yes. So this is something I learned about recently from teenagers, um, where dabbing is apparently you go like this. This group made like a Dance Dance Revolution dabbing, so dab dab revolution, where it would, show, <laughs> it would show an arrow on the screen and you had to dab this way or dab this way or dab this way. Um, it has um, these gloves with the micro bits to use the accelerometers to tell the pitch of your arm and a flex sensor in your elbow to make sure your elbow is bent. Um, that was pretty cool. This explains why Jim was wearing <laughs> this, this little vest. It has a micro bit on the front. So this is Jim. It's got a micro bit. Um, on his arm is, again, another flex sensor used to make sure his elbows are bending. Um, he's at the University of Sydney, and he's doing push-ups. One minute. Um, and the flex sensor is counting how many push-ups he's doing by bending his arm. He also had to do sit-ups and squats, um, and the accelerometer would measure those. So if you know anyone who has, or know anyone who knows, a student in grade 10 or 11 this year, I would highly recommend that they apply for the National Computer Science School Summer School happening next January. Um, but if you don't know anyone in grade 10, maybe someone in grade 5 to 12, where they might be interested in participating in an online programming competition, where this programming competition is very loosely defined as a competition. There are points, but ultimately you don't need to program in order to 
participate in this competition. It starts in August, it goes for five weeks. Um, there are four different levels of difficulty, which is why you don't really need to know how to program. It teaches you everything you need to know as you go through in the five weeks. If you hate typing, you can use a block-based version of Python, or you can use a uh, real version of Python. <laughs> Um, and the advanced stream gets quite hard up to university level. Thanks, Katie. Um, yeah, uh, NCSS was um, one of the, uh, the highlights of my entire life. And so if you do know somebody uh, who is uh, in those age groups, you should uh, definitely, uh, definitely send them along. Um, on deck over on this side, we have uh, Jacinta. But first, Rusty Russell. Blockchain. <laughs> Blockchain. <laughs> Blockchain. <laughs> Blockchain. Blockchain. <laughs> Blockchain. <laughs> Blockchain. <laughs> Blockchain. Blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. Uh, well, we, we, we should have had your talk. You said blockchain so many times. It's such an important topic. Mm, blockchain. Um, Okay, Tim Ansell is on deck, um, so you can guess what he's going to be talking about. Um, but first, Jacinta. Hi everyone, so a few years ago, um, this wonderful person here encouraged me to go to Antarctica. I'd never thought about going to Antarctica before, but hey, why not? In fact, Pia invited a bunch of us to go to Antarctica, and it was awesome. It was totally cool. In fact, I loved it so much, I went back, and I went back for longer. That was 2013, I went the first time, 2014, I went the next time. Now, we say that Australia is isolated, nothing is isolated compared to Antarctica, and there's no internet. You can get there by going down the southern tip of Antarctica, sorry, sorry South America, and down to the Antarctic Peninsula, or, and that takes about 36 hours in the open sea, or you can take multiple days going from either Tasmania or uh, New Zealand. There are also planes. Um, planes are interesting and very weather dependent, as you could imagine. We didn't fly. I don't know what flying is like. The one thing about flying is, of course, that you get very, very little luggage. If you want to go for a decent amount of time, you're going to need to take, bigger, um, take a boat. And that's pretty exciting. 
So anyway, accommodation is authentic. <laughs> and it has all of the modern conveniences, like beds and ovens. It's great. And the scenery is stunning. Like, totally, it really is amazing scenery. And your neighbors are adorable. This is a Gentoo. Have you ever used Gentoo? It's named after these guys. The word Gentoo means brush, and it's based on its little tail. It's like a very brush-like tail. This is a chinstrap penguin. I imagine you can guess why. <laughs> and this is an Adaly penguin. We have Adaly sponsors. This is what an Adaly penguin looks like. They're a little bit shorter than Gentoo, a little bit fatter, and they look like plushy toys. But you're not allowed to cuddle them, it's so unfair. They also poop everywhere, but then all the rest do too. <laughs> Your neighbors are great. You should totally go to Antarctica. And hey, if you hate rain, particularly during the winter, Antarctica is a, is a desert. You won't have to deal with rain. And if you hate summer in Australia, <laughs> Antarctica, you might get like positive six degrees. And if you love stunning views in the dark, I hear it's one of the best places for it. Of course, during winter, because in summer you don't get any dark. It's actually quite amazing how quickly you start getting dark as you leave the place, though. Beautiful views. And if you do want to go, these are the two big employers for people going off to Antarctica in Australia. There are some others who do it, but these are the guys that you should talk to. Look at their websites, and if you're really, really excited, the Australian Antarctic Division has some jobs closing next week. So you could go this year, and it'd be great. The last thing, you should totally go before we lose it, because unfortunately we are. And that fault there, that's only connected by a couple of kilometers now. So we may actually lose that entire uh, shelf very soon. So go, while it's awesome. Thank you. Um, oh, I'm over here this time. Um, so on deck we have uh, Paul, but first, Tim Ansell, who is going to give Tim Ansell's usual lightning talk. Hi everyone, um, can you hear me? Everything's good. So these are cool and awesome projects you should help with, aka I have too many projects. Um, so I also have way too many slides, um, so we'll get to it. I also have Tommy boards left. If you're after them, um, I'll be out there. Pull request or ten dollars. Um, so that's one of my first projects that I have too many of. Um, MicroPython FPGAs. I think we should do this. Um, MicroPython is really useful for doing things which you don't need to do a lot of. Um, FPGAs are good for the custom stuff. They kind of work well together. Um, so yeah, Python everywhere. We're using Python to generate the FPGA stuff, so um, we have a working console on our LMP2 in both real hardware and in emulation. We need help doing peripherals. Um, so yeah, the UART works. Lots more to do. Um, you can go to these slides and these links will work. It's the slide URLs on the bottom here. Um, so that's the First project, second project, is we want to have a good library for Python device tree. The reason is that uh, MicroPython, we want to run on FPGAs. FPGAs are reconfigurable. Um, and that means that they change. And so we want MicroPython to automatically know what's in the FPGA. And so device tree already does this. So we'd like MicroPython to understand device tree and we'd like our FPGA tool chain to generate device tree. Both are Python, so both need a Python device tree library. Um, yeah, this would also be good for putting MicroPython on other ARM chips, which already have device tree support. So, would love help there. Um, I know nothing about device tree other than apparently we should use it, and it's probably a terrible idea. But here's some links. Um, QMU, we have an FPGA, um, but it means you need hardware. Um, we would love QMU for our FPGA environment. Um, so if you know QMU, we would love your help because it makes things a lot quicker. Um, we, a guy called Key2 has been working on this. Um, Joel has managed to reproduce it. We'd love help getting it upstream. Um, the LM32 CPU works. NutX runs in the emulation. A bunch of peripherals work. We'd love to try and get Linux running on this. Um, Again, we need more peripherals and architecture support. 
So a lot more working this time, so there's less for you to do, but we still love help. Um, I'm at two minutes, almost three. Um, one of the open problems is we don't know how to make this up because FPGAs are reconfigurable, so our QMU environment should be reconfigurable. And we'd love to do some type of code simulation with actual cores. Um, again, more links. Um, NUTX is a real-time operating system. We'd love to run it on our FPGA. Um, we'd love your help doing that. It's small, powerful, has active development. Um, we already have it booting in QMU. Um, we'd like to see it booting in real hardware. Apparently it works, but we haven't tested it ourselves. Um, we need peripherals again. You can kind of see a theme here. Lots of peripherals. Um, some things work, apparently. Uh, maybe this can be combined with MicroPython. Um, again, more links. More QMU. Uh, the little Tomu boards, we would love to have QMU emulation for them so you don't need the hardware to write software. Um, Keith, give me a strange face. He likes real hardware, I think. Um, One minute. Yeah, again, peripherals. We need help. More links. Um, we'd love help with our FPGA firmware. Um, this is the board we're using. It's 50 bucks for the MicroPython stuff. Um, it also works with JCore. So if you're interested in that, that's awesome. I'm running out of slides. Um, this is FX2. We need help with that. <laughs> More links. If you do some work, I'll send you a free board. Um, would love to help porting Linux to LightX. And I've got 30 seconds left. Um, Joel has a working port from like 2005, so it's ancient and needs help being updated. Um, again, peripherals. More slides, more links. Would love help with this as well. Go and see my main program talk. And that's all my slides. Thank you. Um, every time I announce Tim at PyCon, I say if you actually do what he like help with things, he might eventually stop doing this. It never works, but you should still help him out on his projects because they're really awesome and they're helping make the AV at this uh, at this conference be quite excellent. Um, up over on this side, we have uh, Rowan, but first, uh, Paul. Speak louder, fantastic. So, um, I've been invited to speak to you today about LoRa. Uh, Pierre invited me. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of things. Uh, the efficiency of presentations, there is only one slide. <laughs> the other thing is uh, who we are, LoRa Taz. Um, I'm going to hopefully tell you enough that you love LoRa as much as me. LoRa itself is something which solves a problem. So, you've probably all got mobile phones, you probably all know that there's all sorts of communication technologies to get data in and out of wireless um, communication devices. LoRa is something that's actually changing a few things. Like on the slide, some key points to take away. The range. So LoRa can actually do urban level ranges of two to three kilometers. So if you're talking about Zigbee or other networking technologies, that's a big changer. You can have deployments out into wide, broad areas like agriculture, and 10 kilometers actually makes a huge difference. So when you're talking about IoT, the other thing is the types of battery or power budget that you have. Now, it's expensive to have all sorts of solar panels. Um, the infrastructure to actually connect power on isn't always available. So if you can have battery power and you can actually have it operating for times where it might be operating with a single small battery for five years, maybe 10 years, you can start putting devices where previously you couldn't have them. So then you look at the fact that you've all got mobile phones. I don't know how many of you might have been putting sensors together, so let's do a, a show of hands. Who works with some sort of sensing and telemetry systems? Put your hands up. And out of you, keep your hands up if you've actually bought SIMs to do machine-to-machine -machine communication. Yeah, so a fair number. It's a cost. But LoRa is something you can deploy into unlicensed spectrum, which means just like putting up your own Wi-Fi gateway, 
you can have a LoRa gateway, you can put it where you need it. So with telcos, they've got licensed spectrum, but you can't normally get them to put a new tower where you want it, and the locals might complain about the tower, and there's all sorts of reasons that you might not actually get that sort of connection. So with unlicensed spectrum, you have the opportunity to have an open system where out of all of the end-to-end, -end, the LoRa technology is actually under patent. It's produced by a company called Semtech, but even they are looking at having other silicon manufacturers manufacturing LoRa chips. It's also bi-directional, and the chipsets are the same for both the gateways and the devices. So you have full bi-directional, 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 that doesn't make a word, word sense at all. You have full bi-directional communications. And if you're looking at some of the competing technologies, that's one of the big changes. So that you can have data going in both directions equally. Otherwise, LoRaWAN, the wide area network, it's something which is an open standard. There are companies out there with proprietary systems, but if you can have an open system for the connectivity, for the network servers between edge devices and application servers, then we can start really democratizing. And what we're doing here, Laura TAS, who we are is we're putting together a pilot supported by the TAS government that will cover the whole of Launceston with a LoRa network. And then there will be network nodes in Hobart and at remote location for a pilot. We're gonna extend that out. You might hear about LoRa in other countries as well. So there are plans in other countries to extend this kind of technology out. One minute. Thanks. But it's, it's ideal for applications. It uses devices that are using embedded Linux. The application servers at the back end, we've been producing platforms all based on Linux, like a lot of, couple of the other speakers. There's an opportunity, there's an opportunity for new applications, for developing open systems to make the end-to-end -end all open. And that's what we like to you, to, for you to know about. So if there's anyone here that's interested in participating in any of our activities, um, there's some contact details there, and then me or Gary, who's also here, can answer some of the more detailed questions. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. So uh, on deck over this side, we have uh, Bron Gondwana, but first, we have Rowan. All right, hello, I'm gonna talk to you about WAS and human languages. Um, I'm Rowan Katow, I write software for Wikipedia, which as you might know, is localized into a number of languages, and according to some people, an absurd number of languages, twice as much as anything else on the internet. Um, so let's get into it. Um, in English, when you write large numbers, you use a period to separate uh, decimals, also called a decimal point, and you use commas to separate groups of thousands. And as you, most of you probably know, in most other European languages, it's the other way around, and you get commas for decimals and periods for thousands. And if you've ever been to Europe, you've probably seen this kind of thing. What you may not know is that in French, you use spaces to separate these things. And lest I make this sound easy, of course these spaces aren't actually spaces, they're a weird Unicode character so that word wrap doesn't break your number in half. Um, also, if you speak German, then you might use apostrophes to separate groups of thousands. And before I get writing Germans in the audience, I'm of course talking about Swiss German. <laughs> um, so let's go back to English. Um, you all recognize this as English but you may not recognize this as English. If you're an English speaker and you've never seen this before, then you should perhaps visit India, where they group um, thousands, quote unquote, in groups of two after the initial group of three all the way on the right, which means we should not call these thousand separators, we should call them group separators. And this happens because while we use thousand, million, and billion for large numbers, they use thousand, lakh, and crore for 10 to the five and 10 to the seven respectively. Um, so let's talk about numbers and digits in general. In English, you write them this way, but if you speak Lao or Burmese, you write, might, might write them this way. By the way, if you're wondering why there's so many characters in Unicode, it's this and also emoji. <laughs> um, in Bengali, we get this. Um, note the decimals or the group separators are groups of two because it's a language spoken in India. And um, the thing that looks like an eight is not an eight, it's a four, and the thing that looks like a nine is a seven. And um, in Arabic, you get this, which might not even be recognizable as numbers very much anymore. That thing at the end is not a dot, it's a zero. And the red thing, the upside down comma, is their own decimal separator. That's right, they have an, their own Unicode clone point for this. And um, it also doesn't render the same in all fonts because when I was writing these slides, it looked like this. So let's talk about plurals, these are fun. 
In English, they're very simple. If you have, uh, there's only a singular form and a plural form, there's only two forms. And if you have one of something, you use singular. If any other number, you use, you use the other form. In Hebrew, it's slightly more complicated. Some words, but not all, have a dual form, which you use when there's two of something. Um, when you have three to ten of something, you definitely always use the plural form, but if you have more than ten, you sometimes use a singular form, sometimes a plural, uh, and sometimes both are okay, depending on how colloquial you want to be. Also, these are definitely written in the correct direction. Hebrew is written from right to left. Um, there's lots more fun to explore there. Go to rtl.wtf for more about that. Um, Irish is a bit more complicated. Every word only has three distinct forms, but not every word takes different forms in the same scenarios. So there's a total of five uh, possibilities. Uh, for one, for two, for three to six, for seven to ten, and everything else. Because that's not complicated enough, their brethren on the other side of the sea would not be outdone, and so Welsh has almost the same, has exactly the same words in fact, but they've added a case for zero. Also, the ranges are now gone, and so now you just have cases for the individual numbers zero, one, two, three, and six, because six is special, obviously. Um, but we can also do math in these cases. Welcome to Icelandic, where the singular case is triggered if, you ha if n mod 10 equals 1, but n mod 100 is not equal to 11. <laughs> but we can do better than that, because Polish has three forms, actually four if you consider fractions, but I'm looking at integers. Um, and the middle form, which CLDR just starts calling few because you run out of words to describe all these things, um, is triggered when n mod 10 is 2, 3, or 4, but n mod 100 is not 12, 13, or 14. Um, this is obviously insane, right? Like, who would ever speak a language that is this complicated? Ladies and gentlemen, I give you English. <laughs> Minutes. That's all I got. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hu humans are, are odd. <laughs> uh, on deck we have Richard Jones, but first, Bron Gondwana. So to the hecklers out there who, who just tweeted me, it's on silent. You're going to have to heckle out loud. Last year I did a talk about something called Two Skip. And 2Skip was a database that I built, a key value database embedded in C, because there was nothing out there that came back fast after a crash. If your host crashed or your software crashed and you needed to recover that database and start working quickly, everything else the story was, yeah, you run recovery, it might take half an hour for a big database, it wasn't acceptable. So I wrote 2Skip, and 2Skip's great. Some things about the talk are still exactly the same. I still live in Melbourne, I'm still at Fastmail, I still work on Cyrus IMAPD, and I still mostly work on open source, yay. 2Skip. It's great, but it has three F syncs per write, per commit. And the main reason is in the middle there, append data, you have to update random pointers throughout the file. And after a crash, there might be pointers pointing past the end of the file. You need to reread the whole thing to fix it. So I went through the database goals and said, what can we change to make this thing run faster? I looked, there's still nothing out there that's embedded and fast and crash safe. So here we go. Zero skip. You want to build a NoSQL? I'm going to do it again. Yep. At Fastmail for search indexes, we tried lots of different things to update our search indexes fast enough. And in the end, the only way to do it was to write to tempfs first and then pack those files down later. That way, reading from multiple databases all works nicely. And the main thing is that you only compact the read-only parts of it together. And that way, you can substitute the compacted one over the ones that were there before and you get an identical semantic meaning. So readers can just switch over to the new one when they're ready. I was going to use 2skip, and I was going to call this thing 3skip, and I proposed a talk, and I didn't get accepted, which is good, because I never wrote 3skip. I decided I don't need skip lists anymore, because they're read-only databases. I don't even need the double point. I don't need anything except a binary search. So here, here we go. This is what a zero skip file will look like. It's just a log. Tiny little header, key values followed by commits, one or more changes. The value might be a tombstone saying, I've deleted this record, and that's all that's there. And at some point, you decide to close off the file, and you put a set of ordered pointers at the end and a finalization record. And you get more files, and you get more files. And at some point, you decide, I want to compact some together. So you have a file name that includes the UUID of the database. Very easy to recover from these things. And in sorted order, from oldest to newest, your file system will always have the right databases in the right place. And you can see just by glancing at it, that's complete. And so on. We add some more, we compact some more together. Over time, it'll look something like this. There'll be a bunch of files. The more files you've got, the slower the read, but you can always repack in the background. For that last log file, 
I'm just going to keep an index in memory, or you can reread the whole thing because it's short, and use file system semantics to lock. To commit a transaction, you write something at the end, and it has a CRC32 of the data in this transaction. So to tell if you've loaded a file cleanly, you read the end of the file. Is it a commit record? Does it have a CRC32 in a range? Read that range, check that it matches up. All good. And then to finish off a log file, you put that set of pointers into the log file on the end, put a finalization record. You never, ever touch that file again, and you start writing to a new log file. When you're repacking, you select only files that have been finalized, repack them all, rewrite with a file name that covers that range, and it's all good. And we get down to one F-sync per transaction. We never, ever rewrite anything. We're only appending to files. So the only way that repacking happens is you make some new file, make a new file with the contents of the old files, and then push that into place. And you don't need to define in the spec exactly when you repack. You use something like this. When you've got two things that are about the same size, you repack them to the next size down, and so on and so forth, and a little bit of metrics. One it's not done yet. But Cyrus IMAP, the project's mostly run by fast mail people these days. That's kind of the struggle with any of these projects, that to find people who have the time to work on it, we're paying most of them. But if you want to get involved, we'd love to have you involved. If you want to tell me my design's crap, tweet me there. I'll turn my phone back on after the talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. So uh, we're actually now at, uh, at the overflow talks, which means we got through all the original lightning talks in the amount of time that we expected they would, which is kind of great. We have four more. Over on this side on deck, we have Paul Waper. But first, Richard Jones. Yay, captive audience. <laughs> Okay, so I'm here to talk about you know, PyCon AU, uh, which is um, a conference that I ran last year. PyCon uh, stands for Python Conference, Python Conference Australia. Uh, who's been to a PyCon AU? That's awesome to see. Uh, for the rest of you, PyCon AU is run very similarly to uh, LinuxConf. Um, it, it's got a very similar feel to LinuxConf. It's, but it's a gathering of people who have wrenches. <laughs> it's a gathering of Python professionals, enthusiasts, students, and teachers, uh, and basically all coming together to discuss Python and the ecosystem and world around Python. We held it last August in Melbourne, and that was the seventh Australian Python conference. We had about 650 people there. We had a wonderful turnout, and it's an amazing community. We had, a, I think I counted roughly because I counted quickly, 96 presentations, a really good mix of technical and non-technical talks, but all still with that focus on Python and you know, the Python developers and ecosystem. We also had a brand new uh, specialist track on the Internet of Things, and it was a huge hit. It was all in this wonderful, wonderful venue, the Melbourne Convention Center, and surprisingly enough, we're doing it again. Um, so we'll be running again this uh, August in Melbourne at the same venue. Uh, we'll be running it between the 3rd and 8th of August. This year, we're going to be adding a few things. Uh, we're adding childcare, uh, a dedicated tutorials day, that'll be on the 3rd before the main track starts, and some other stuff that we haven't really nailed down yet, but we're pretty damned excited about. Uh, our CFP will open in March-ish, early March, uh, and we're happy to announce that the specialist tracks, which is our Friday day of tracks, which is kind of like mini comps, uh, will be the Education Seminar, Django Con AU, the Internet of Things, and Science and Data. Uh, we'd love to have you along. Oh, there's those things. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I do strongly recommend you get along to uh, PyCon AU, even if you're only like tangentially interested in Python. It's a really fantastic conference. Um, and I. The t-shirts are fantastic, but um, I didn't say that. I might have had something to do with designing them. Um, uh, Alexa Sarai is on deck over here, but first, Paul Waypar. Hi, everyone. Um, this is going to be an interesting one, because be, being the very last reserves um, slot on the lightning talks, I thought I wasn't actually going to be make it up up to the stage. Um, when I proposed this, I hadn't seen the two talks from this morning, which are all about hacking your laptop 
to actually get it to do the things that you want to. And we're discovering that trying to get into all of that information, the, you know, the BIOS, the embedded controller, then you have to work out what our encryption algorithm you're using to put stuff on there so you can talk to your battery to actually use the battery that you bought. And I thought to myself, how many people in this room are using a laptop that was designed for OS X? Excellent. How many people are using a laptop that was designed for Windows that you had to overwrite Windows in order to get it to work? And then you had to sort of hope that Linux was up to all of the device drivers in there. And then you had to put up with how, whether, the, whether or not those things would even work. And could you talk to your battery? And could you actually get the um, brightness controls to work? And so forth. So when I, when I was looking for laptops recently, I decided that I would go and actually put my money where my mouth was and buy a System76 laptop, which is actually designed for Linux. It comes with Ubuntu comes with an Ubuntu key, which is nice. Um, but the best part to me about ordering this thing was I didn't have to wade through 176 different laptop designs. They're all mind-bogglingly similar and yet different. And it's really hard to know which of these 176 laptop designs is actually going to give you the BIOS or the, the processor that you want. And, and expand up to 64 gig of memory and support two SATA drives. And, you know, it, it, it's like you have to know what these model numbers are before you look into them to try and find out what the model numbers are and what they mean and what you actually get. No, System76, you go there, you choose one of five different laptop types, and then you customize it. That thing can take two two terabyte drives and an extra terabyte of NVM drives, which re read speed is two gigabit. So, and that will take up to 64 gig of memory. So it's, as far as I'm concerned, I bought it so that I would never have to upgrade it or change it for another, another 10 years. My lap last laptop lasted for that long. I figure, why not this one? But the big problem, the thing that I'm really passionate about is we should be voting with our wallets. We should be voting with our feet. We should say, no, I don't actually want to use something that I have to give up control over, that I have to give up the ability to put open source software on, that I, I, at some point in the future, the, uh, the laptop manufacturer can use the, the um, management system in the CPU that I can't touch to talk to my Ethernet, to get an IP address, to talk to their thing, to upgrade my firmware so that I can't run Linux on it anymore. And the, the hope that we have with things like Zerezen and System76 and the Purity laptop, I can't remember the, the particular name, is that you're actually talking to people that are designing these things for Linux. One minute. So that you can actually get your hardware and do what you want with it. Oh, thank you. So uh, on deck is our last uh, lightning talk, which is Clinton Roy. But first, Alexa. Hello. Okay, cool. Right. So, um, hello, everyone. Uh, OpenQA, life is too short for manual testing. Uh, I actually don't use OpenQA in my day job, so this will be a very interesting talk, but it's still pretty cool. So, a couple of people gave talks about, uh, there was an ODF talk where someone was like, oh, I test, you know, what documents look like, but I actually do it all manually, which is um, an interesting decision to make, but, you know, it's kind of cool. Kind of cool. So, um, OpenQA, what is it? It is a Perl-based framework, obviously. Uh, <laughs> that allows you to emulate a user at a particular program. Uh, you can uh, run commands directly in a console, for example. You can emulate a keyboard and mouse. Um, and the really, really cool part is that it allows you to use needles, which is essentially you take a screenshot, take another screenshot, and then it uses OpenCV to compare the two screenshots and allows you to cut out a small part of the screen and say, I want to check that this part is the same as this other part. So. 
Uh, what does it look like? It looks like this. Uh, it's a bit of a bad shot, but I'll actually show you the website because obviously I want to tempt the demo gods and I will show you what the website actually looks like. But uh, before that, I actually decided to make a backup. So it's used by OpenSUSE and SUSE to test our distributions. So every single version of Tumbleweed, which is our rolling release distribution, um, it is well tested. Well, I mean, it's slightly failing, but you know, let's, let's say it's tested. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, it is tested. Um, and it's tested every single release. Before it's released, we can see exactly what works. Uh, and actually, Fedora started, has started using it recently, I believe, for Rawhide, uh, which is pretty awesome. And so what is a needle? So as I said, OpenCV. And you can see another screenshot of uh, what it looks like. It's hard to tell because I took the worst possible screenshot. But uh, this is like this cutout can be tested to make sure that, it's, um, that the two screenshots are identical. So uh, it actually does, also it does fuzzy comparisons, which is kind of cool. So you can take a two screenshots and say, I want it to be 75% similar, which uh, means, for example, if you want to be, oh, it looks kind of the same, but maybe you know, the font aliasing is slightly different, because obviously font aliasing is always broken. Um, but you, know, you, you can do stuff like that. And also, you can do console testing, but you know, consoles is just regular expressions, and you know, everyone knows how to do that already. Um, it's an example of a test that failed. You can see that you know, this is what it should look like, and this is what it actually looks like, and there's a 0% match. Uh, it also gives you full debugability, which is pretty cool. So um, the way it works is that your script is sort of like a, oh, how would I install X? And I'm like, okay, so I will go through the steps and I will, you know, press enter, press control, blah blah blah. Um, and so every single screenshot, every single screen change is stored uh, in OpenQA for later debugging. You can also get the VM disk image of it, and you can also get the source CD used to create the environment, which is incredibly useful if you want to debug why the hell Yast is broken. Which, um, yeah, and yeah, so it's pretty awesome stuff. So you know, use it today. Uh, you know, if you're writing a distribution, uh, QA testing is really, really hard. So why not automate yourself out of a job? Uh, and obviously, the solution is to uh, well, actually, someone has to write the Perl scripts for now until you know someone writes the script to do that. And here's the website. And so I am now going to do a well, not live demo because I can't do the whole testing. But uh, here's what the website looks like. Uh, this is the actual. This is the actual live OpenSUSE one. Uh, yada yada. yada. Here's, here's test summaries. For some reason, the latest release is actually. Well, not released. The latest candidate is incredibly broken at the moment, but whatever. Um, and yeah, so here's, it has a cool slider. I mean, this is a bad example because I'm testing two wrong screenshots, but it has a cool slider you can use. And if you like Perl, there's plenty of Perl you can write. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Perl guy, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, so uh, Clinton went bushwalking recently and is going to tell us all about it. Uh, so, so this talk is primarily photos. Um, so the week before, LCA, Beck, uh, Richard, and I went walking. Is Richard still here? Yes, excellent, cool. Um, so we flew down from Hobart to Melaleuca, and then we walked back to Cockle Creek, uh, then uh, caught a, a bus back. That took us uh, six days. Um, all of that track, um, the strip that we flew in on, was all built by Denny King. Every Tasmanian should know his story. Um, there's just no excuse for not knowing his story down here. He, him and his family are amazing. Uh, that was my stupidly heavy pack. This was the stupidly tiny plane we took. Um, lovely shots of, of Hobart. So everything from here on in is a photo. Um, so there's a pointy thing at the top of the hill. I imagine that's a, a radio tower or something. Someone might know that. That's the lagoon near uh, Melaleuca. Um, that was used as a source of water for tin mining uh, out that way. Um, the, plant, the plane was bouncing around madly, so that's why the focus is off, but that is actually the runway we're heading towards. You notice how many straight lines it doesn't have. Um, that's our plane leaving, so we had to walk out of there. Um, these were companions for the entire trip, ants the size of um, animals, basically. Um, they hurt when they bit. Uh, that's uh, Beck and Richard uh, trying to get away from me on the first day. Um, my camera takes wonderful panorama shots. Um, it's just ridiculously how nice and easy it is. So lots of oohs and ahs for my lovely photography. So that's uh, Beck and Richard getting a little bit further away from me. Um, lots, there's lo wind, wind and rain um, completely make this track. There's lots of Oh, lots and lots of flowers uh, throughout the trip. Um, when you see the clouds hitting mountains that you know you're going to have to walk over, you know you're going to have fun. 
Um, you can see at the top of this one, um, you can see the track. Um, and sometimes that's really good when you can see the track. Other times it's not so good when you can see the track. Um, so there are, and, and you can see in that one, the track just sort of keeps on going over and over. And you know when the track's going that way and you can just sort of dimly see the mountain in the background and then another mountain behind it, you've got a few good days ahead of you. Um, so lots and lots of, of, of uh, lovely uh, flowers and plants. I think that's the Iron Bounds, which is the big nasty one. Um, you can see the track going right up to the top of the ridge of that one. Uh, so that's, that's me and Beck. Um, I have a particular aversion to sunlight. I've, I've had a skin cancer removed, so I'm very, very careful with sun these days. Um, and that's Beck and Richard getting a little bit further away from me. Um, I would often stop and take photos of them from behind and uh, catch up a little bit later on. Um, cloud and rain all the time. Uh, lovely flowers, and as you go up, there's tiny little microclimates, so the, the plants just change all the time. Um, a lot of it is, is native graph, uh, grass. The Aboriginals burnt a lot of the forests to make uh, movement and hunting easier. There are still uh, many, many pockets of uh, forest left, however. Um, every night, you'd be heading to, towards the coast uh, to camp. I, well, this night we had a fisherman shine their lights at our campsite all night long. Um, here's a bit of engineering. Uh, this is two. Uh, this is a double hammock that you can see. So that's actually two hammocks, one on top of each other, because those are the, the two nicest trees that they found to hang those. Um, a lot of the walk is very muddy. So over the last 20 years, there's been a lot of boardwalks put in. Um, uh, I love this shot. It's a beautiful shot, but it also captures the moment I've got sand in my camera. Um, there's a lot of bird life. Uh, most of the birds are really tiny and very, uh, very flitty, so it was, it was actually quite hard to get any um, uh, bird shots. Um, sea lion. I didn't think I'd be seeing a sea lion. Um, I do have some other shots, but um, that's probably the best one I've got because I was mostly keep trying to keep away from it. Um, beaches uh, everywhere. Like, like I could do a full 360 of beaches. Um, one of the lakes we had, we uh, cross uh, by boat, and then you attach another boat to that, bring it back, and then go it over it, so you had to leave a boat on either side. I did this trip six times, so you can work out how many times I screwed this up. Because uh, it, it turns out that as well as a boat, you also need all the safety gear, and you need enough safety gear and enough paddles on both sides for that to work. Lots of animals at, um, all the way through, uh, little paddy melons looking for food, um, beautiful uh, lagoons, beautiful lakes, beautiful uh, sunsets and sunrises, uh, beautiful water, um, lots of creek crossings. We had great weather. We had great um, tides. I was very happy with all of that. And I will leave you with the nicest shots. I personally think you've got to be slightly mad to do the, uh, the South Cape track, but thank you for taking back all the photos. It, it's clearly a, a beautiful part of the world. Um, huh. mm. Yeah, I, I, I feel the same way. Um, so yes, we're, we're, at the, we're at the final session of, uh, of this here conference. So uh, thank you all for coming and making it this far. Um, it's, uh, it's great to see so many of you still here. Um, so I'm going to run through a bunch of things that I need to talk about, thank some people, um, and do, uh, do some uh, introductions of, uh, of new people who you might be interested in meeting. Um, so I want to talk about something that's quite close to my heart that uh, I hope you've noticed over the last week because I think it's a very important thing. Um, hopefully you get some level of idea about how I, how I, about how we as a team uh, think about making sure that people feel welcome, feel safe at this conference. Um, we've had lots and lots of signage around there. Um, you might remember uh, when you filled in your badge, uh, when you registered for the conference, you might have filled in some free text uh, on, your, um, on your profile, which uh, ended up showing up on your badge. Um, one of the more fun things that I've seen it used for, or more important things really, is people putting their, uh, their preferred pronouns on their badges. Uh, this is something that I saw people um, basically writing on their badges in, in previous years. And uh, one of the things that, um, 
that LCA hasn't really let you do before unless you go through a weird hash collision challenge is, uh, is basically putting what you want on your badge. And uh, put what you want on your badge you did. Um, I learned far, far, far too much about Unicode in the last two weeks once I discovered people putting in uh, putting emoji and, and upside, down, uh, upside down text. But um, hopefully, I've, hopefully you found this a, uh, a way to have made you feel more welcome and more included at the conference. Um, and thanks to Simon Lyle for taking all those photos. I, I did not think to do that, so, uh, so thank you very much, Simon. Um, our friends at GitHub let us run free childcare for this week. So um, I think we had like 10 or, 10 or 11 kids throughout the entirety of the week um, with parents who obviously would not have been otherwise able to make it to, uh, to this conference if, uh, if that wasn't offered. So, uh, so thanks to GitHub for that and for funding the assistance grants. Um, they helped us bring, um, I think it was seven or eight people who couldn't otherwise afford to come to this conference and, and let them be here and let them share in this community. I hope the people who received that um, enjoyed the week and can find a way to contribute in future years. Um, the sum total of these programs um, basically meant that we had really quite good uh, gender balance this year. We had about 14, uh, 14 or 15% of our attendees uh, being not men. Um, once again, I hope this is a, a figure that, uh, that future years can, uh, can improve upon and also continue to report. Um, and we also had, um, we also had uh, the highest ever uh, proportion, sorry, the highest raw number of women presenting in the main program and the equal highest proportion of women presenting in the main program. In fact, until some late cancellations came about, uh, you would have been able to um, always go to, a, at any time during the conference, go to a presentation delivered by a woman. In some cases, you could actually go to, you could choose your presentations. And that's something that um, that LCA hasn't, uh, hasn't managed at least for the last few years. So uh, thanks to our program committee for helping us to deliver that. Um, and hopefully this is something that we can improve in future years. Um, I personally want to, want to thank the Python Software Foundation. Uh, they, uh, through their, uh, their grants program, enabled me to write the, uh, the new ticket sales software that Linux ConfAU used this year, which let us achieve a lot of the things that, we, uh, that, uh, that I just discussed. So uh, let's talk about some, uh, about some numbers that you might have seen over or that, well, have something to do with, uh, with this week. Uh, firstly, this number is wrong. Um, I got this before lunch, and, uh, and Martin's lightning talk tells me that there were, in fact, uh, 104 users on the, uh, the new Matrix chat service, um, which I, uh, I hope uh, both replaces IRC and replaces a bunch of the other proprietary uh, chat services that we're using. Um, thanks to them, they've made huge inroads into making this the more popular uh, chat service that we use at LCA next year. So uh, thanks to Martin, um, Ben Sternfels, and Scott Bragg for, for pushing that along um, throughout this year. There were 554 people, including uh, people with paid tickets, including speakers, including our, our sponsor attendees. Uh, that's, that's quite a lot of people, um, which I'm somewhat impressed by. We sold 2,900 coffee cups um, at the coffee cup stall. Um, so uh, thanks to uh, Ritual Coffee Tasmania for coming along and, uh, and producing some really quite fantastic coffee, and also to Wargaming Sydney, who sponsored everyone's first two uh, free coffees. So um, here's a number that I've been showing in the opening slides every day, uh, 66 megabits a second down and 84.54 uh, megabits up. Yesterday I got an email from Steve Walsh saying that I've been underselling his work. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know Steve, it's normally not a very good idea to upset him. So Steve also sent me a collection of photos, or sorry, images rather, um, that he insisted that I display in the conference closing. Uh, this is the first one. <laughs> the following email said that when you run the speed test command line uh, interface uh, program, you, if you exceed a gigabit per second, it returns 
zero as the URL. So he couldn't actually get a picture for it, but wants you to look at the numbers on there, uh, which says something like uh, 3.7 gigabits per second down and 446 megabits up. And then he decided that speedtest.net was actually not a very good uh, demonstration of his service and wanted you to look at this one instead. <laughs> um, Steve works for, a, for an academic ISP. Um, you will notice that this is, in fact, not an academic facility for most people. Probably at all. Uh, <laughs> So uh, the, the fact that he has been able to get Arnett's uh, bandwidth into this, uh, into this here venue has been fantastic. Um, it enabled us to download 1.63 terabytes of data throughout this week uh, with a peak incoming traffic into this venue of 240 megabits per second with peak outgoing traffic, basically the AV pushing streams to YouTube of 375 megabits per second. He ran 1.3 kilometers of CAT6 specifically around this conference on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and into Monday morning. He did not sleep on Sunday night. He walked roughly 93 kilometers throughout this week um, and enabled 570 people to connect to the Wi-Fi at once. Um, he also uh, gave the people at the residences internet. Um, I am... Um, I, I appreciate this graph because if you look at, the, uh, at where those peaks are, it shows you that people are using the internet when the conference wasn't actually on, um, which, is, which is good because it means you were all here, which is wonderful. Um, so yeah, thanks to Steve. Um, you've really helped make this a, uh, an excellent conference uh, as, as per usual. Um, Something we did differently this year, um, rather than assigning the role of introducing uh, our speakers and facilitating Q&A to our, uh, our regularly scheduled volunteers, we invited you, the regular attendees, to sign up as session chairs. Uh, 30 of you did that, and uh, so I, I'd like to thank you on behalf of, uh, of the speakers and the, uh, and the rest of the conference for, for helping make this, uh, making our talks and our speakers be introduced well. We also, we also had 12 mini comps, and uh, I'm going to go through, uh, go through all of them because I believe they all deserve our, uh, our uh, gratitude. Uh, on Monday, we had Ewan McNeil from the Systems Administration mini conf. We had Katie McLaughlin, Jacinta Richardson, and Lana Bridley from WootConf. We had Matthew Senja from Open Knowledge. We had Andrew Donlan from the Kernel mini conf. We had Tim Nugent and Ducky from the Games and Foss mini conf. We had Ben Short and Scott Bragg from the Open Radio Miniconf. And on Tuesday, we had Fraser Tweedale and Jason Cohen from the Security and Privacy Miniconf. We had Deb Nicholson and Donna Benjamin from the Free Software Law and Policy Miniconf. We had Tyler Croy from the Testing and Automation Miniconf. We had Vian Brasseur from Community Leadership Summit X at LCA. We had Brian Moss and Lana Brindley from Docs Down Under. And we had Andy Gelm, Jonathan Oxer, and many, many more people from the Open Hardware Miniconf. Um, our Miniconfs are a way for us as organizers to put on a much longer conference without us doing quite as much work to make those two days happen. But it's thanks to those people who I just mentioned um, for making, uh, making there actually be stuff for you to go to. So uh, I think they all deserve quite a warm round of applause. <laughs> We received 130-odd more proposals than LCA has ever received this year in our main call for proposals. Um, this was quite impressive, um, and it led to us selecting six tutorials and 75 talks with 80 speakers. Um, thanks to them, uh, you've helped make this program uh, excellent and a, uh, a true standout uh, Linux Conf AU. So thanks to you. And uh, we also had four keynote speakers, um, namely uh, Pia War, Dan Callahan, Nadia Egbal, and uh, Rommel. Um, 
I feel uh, I feel like the uh, the role of, of choosing the mini comp, oh, sorry, the, the keynote speakers this year was, was somewhat easy because uh, basically I got my first choices for everything, which was great. Nobody, nobody declined us, um, and I think collectively they've they've done a really good job at uh, at basically challenging some of the uh, some of the widely held beliefs that the free software and open source movement have. And so I'd like to thank them for giving up their time and sharing their their wisdom and expertise. There were also 30 conference volunteers who, um, who basically uh, gave up a week or more of their time to, uh, to come down here and uh, miss out on the conference. But um, in doing so, they helped put on a really memorable experience for all of you, so, uh, uh, so thanks to them. There were also seven uh, organizers of this conference. I'll be thanking the volunteers and the organizers a bit more uh, formally later on. So. There were 21 sponsors this year. I hope I counted them correctly. Um, without them, we would not be able to put on a conference to the standard which we have. Um, they've, um, they've basically made this, this entire thing possible um, in a way that hasn't resulted, us in, uh, resulted in us charging you an absolutely ridiculous amount of money. Um, our Emperor Penguin sponsor, firstly, IBM. And secondly, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Um, we thank both of them for their really quite substantial contributions to this conference. Um, we also have AARNet, who are one of our King Penguin sponsors, and also our internet sponsor. And the Tasmanian government, who are a King Penguin sponsor, and our speaker travel sponsor. Our Royal Penguin sponsors, Red Hat and Sousa. Our Daily Penguin sponsors, Google, Elastic, and the Information Technology Professionals Association. And our other major sponsors, GitHub, who funded our grants program and our childcare. Wargaming, who funded our coffee stall, and Take Flight, who donated their time to produce our absolutely fantastic website. And finally, our Fairy Penguin sponsors, uh, namely the Tasmanian Partnership for Advanced Computing at the University of Tasmania, Sticker Mule, Tas Networks, Hortonworks, Spreedbox, Coordinates, Lulzbot, the FreeBSD Foundation, and Mozilla. So we have been talking about the future all through this week, um, but now it's time to talk about the future of LinuxConf AU. And to do that, I'd like to welcome Kathy Reed, the new president of Linux Australia. Thanks, Chris, but you don't get off that lightly. You may not know what's involved in running the LinuxConf AU, David and I are still recovering from last year. It takes hours and hours and hours of dedication, commitment, grit, determination, patience, and many, many other personal qualities to put your hand up and say, yes, I'm going to bring a Linux Conf AU to my town. Chris, you've done exactly that this year, and you've done it brilliantly. And on behalf of Linux Australia, I'd just like to say thank you. You'll get to do this again at the end. And there has been a secret project to put together an incredible gift for Chris and the team. Uh, I won't go into that now, but uh, you've got some uh, incredible supporters there who've done that for you. So Chris and the team will be very well looked after. Looking towards the future, it's now my honour as president of LA to announce where Linux Confer you will be next year. Ooh. 
Now you saw Jacinta's presentation, the beautiful Antarctica. <laughs> we had a little trouble with the penguins. We couldn't get them to hold a pen to do the contract signing. No, no not really. You heard the rumour about the cruise ship. Ooh. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> so, without further ado, shall we see? <laughs> the winner is... Um, yeah, so uh, 2018, we're coming to Sydney. That was meant to work a bit smoother than that. <laughs> Not quite how we wanted to do it, but... Hey. Um, so our theme is a little bit of history repeating. Uh, some people up here on stage with me, this is my awesome team. They have been fantastic to work with in secret over the last 12 or so months since we got accepted. Uh, my name is Bruce. This is James, Saatchi, Jamie, Mark, and John. Hopefully I did that in the right order. <laughs> uh, so, first of all, we've had a fantastic week here. This is just a few of our little highlights that we've really enjoyed throughout the week. <laughs> uh, and I know that everyone's going to say this every, at, soon, at some point, but um, it really does take, and Kathy just said it as well, it does take a lot of effort to put on one of these things. We've already just had a glimpse of it so far. Uh, but with the entire team would like just to take a moment and thank the 2017 team for the fantastic job that they have done and we hope that we can um, keep up to this high standard they have set this year. So the theme of a little bit of history repeating, it came about um, mostly because LCA first came to Sydney in 2001 it then came back in 2007, and for, this is the first time an LCA has gone to three, to this, a city, three times in a row. Well, not in a row, but third time. Uh, so 2018 will be the third time it has been in Sydney, and we thought it was quite fitting that we'd take a quick look at the future, but through examining the past, and how sometimes things can cycle around, they can repeat themselves. Uh, we think Sydney is going to be a fantastic location. Uh, past LCAs have been fantastic. We do have a few little icons around the place, like the um, Opera House and Hubbard Bridge. You might have seen those before. We also have some really awesome restaurants and uh, many things that will be happening throughout this, uh, the conference as well. For starters, there's a Sydney festival that is held at the same time. It's actually made up of a lot of small events scattered throughout Sydney. And uh, if you want to have something to do, there will be plenty to do and see at that time. Our last day is also Australia Day, so uh, that's going to be another little awesome thing for us to do on that day. The venue itself is UTS, who are providing a really awesome space. We're pleased that, by what we've seen so far, uh, and we think you'll like it as well. It really is a, an ideal location. Uh, it's really central. There are lots of things around it. Uh, there's food five minutes away. There is uh, a train station five minutes away. 
There's a few things all within walking distance of it. Uh, so what we want you to do is we want you to tell your friends, we want you to tell your family, tell your coworkers, tell your pets. If you're the boss, we want you to tell your staff about it. We want as many people to come along to this as possible. It will be awesome. Uh, well, we hope it will be awesome. <laughs> um, very soon, we will have our, a new look on our website. I'm not sure if anyone actually visited the old website, but we will have it a lot sooner than I thought. Um, I think they're <laughs> updating it right now. Uh, on there will be how you can be part of the conference if you want. We are, we are looking for a few extra people to, on our team. Uh, it has things on how to contact us, which is kind of important as well. And it's also where we're going, we will list uh, announcements and key bits of information as they come to light throughout the course of the year. Usual call for papers, registrations, that sort of thing. So we have our website. We have a Twitter account. Some of you have already seen it and liked it and followed it already this week. There's the mailing list, which everyone should be already subscribed to. It's live. Um, if you haven't subscribed to these things, I highly recommend that you do so you do not miss out on anything that's happening. Um, also, if you want to like, comment, subscribe, no, that didn't work, that was a YouTube thing. Um, yeah, so save the date. We will be coming to you in, from January 26th, uh, 2nd to the January 26th in Sydney UTS. We look forward to seeing each and every one of you there. Thank you. I've, um, I've had the pleasure of uh, having uh, James and Bruce from the 2018, I've been saying 2017 for the last year, it's kind of weird to say, to say that. The Linux U 2018 team being embedded within the LCA 2017 team for the last year and uh, seeing uh, some of their plans and uh, also getting their advice on, on many things has been, uh, has been wonderful. I think you're going to be in for a, a really excellent conference next year. Karen, I'm going, to I'm going to embarrass you. Could you come down here? Thank you. Where did my spare microphone go? Ah, it went over there. I'm going to grab the spare microphone because that's probably going to be useful in a moment. Um, so we had a raffle. You're probably well aware of it. I've only been talking about it every single morning. Um, and I've just volunteered you to help draw it. Um, so, um, firstly, I have a photo for you. Um, that's a lot of raffle ticket books. And Matt is going to correct me if I say it. There are 3,600 unique raffle tickets. Yes. OK, so if you, go to the, if you go to the shop and buy 3,600 raffle tickets, uh, buy all the raffle ticket books you can get, you can only get 3,600 of them. Um, that's a problem. <laughs> um, so we sold every single unique generic raffle ticket um, three times over. Um, <laughs> um, just, just, just uh, we, we have actually figured out a system to make sure they're actually now like non-repeated, so um, that's, that's not a problem if you're gonna like heckle me for that. Uh, bring out the box. <laughs> it's uh, making a perfectly random process. We've been shaking it for about 10 minutes downstairs. But now you've seen it be shaken. Wonderful. Ooh. Oh. If you like. I have not. I don't know why they used such strong tape. <laughs> This is, this, this is standard Matthew, he over-engineers everything. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, so, 
Uh, let's have uh, let's have my slides back, please, so I can say what we've got. So um, we had uh, Lulzbot donate a 3D printer, which we don't actually have in our possession with us. However, if you get drawn for that, um, Tim Sarong, who is I presume around here, yeah, he's over there. Um, he'll take your shipping details, and Lulzbot will in fact mail you that 3D printer. We also have with us a uh, Spreedbox uh, plug-in uh, computing device which lets you run uh, Nextcloud uh, relatively easily, including a video conferencing thing, so you can self-host a whole bunch of stuff in your own house. We also, now that uh, Tanya's actually walked through the, the venue and signed all of our lectern fronts, we actually now have uh, a signed lectern front featuring uh, the original Linux Conf AU 2017 artwork. And we also had donated to us a Spherobot BB-8 droid. So there's now four prizes where originally we thought there were only three. So uh, let's, let's take out first. First prize. So is that... Ooh, so we have a lookup. Oh, dear. We have a lookup table for some people. <laughs> No name on this one. No, there isn't. What's the date on it? Uh, We're using unique dates for some people. 2 April 2020. I didn't have anything to do with this. <laughs> so, it's the April one. <laughs> Sorry, can I see the... There we go. 2018, I'm sure, will print their own raffle tickets and actually have enough. Okay. This is uh, Darren Coco. So uh, go over and see Tom, uh, Tim, and he'll get you your free printer shipped to you. OK, so second. Stir it up a little. Here we go. Um, this Chris. Yeah. We have an announcement. Oh. I live in a tiny apartment and have absolutely nowhere to put this. So I'm putting it back in the raffle and giving it to someone else. Thank you very much. Um, I think, I think that's, that's Arvi. Arvi Miller, you here? So that's purple B47. B47. With the black with the line, I think. <laughs> So uh, go speak to uh, go speak to Tim, and he'll uh, sort out your uh, your 3D printer. Okay, let's try and actually get second prize this time. Okay, great. Can I? Yeah, you can. Oh, I'll give you a mic. Hang on. Jan Schmidt. Uh, so go see Tim. And he'll hand the uh, he'll hand the thingy over to you. He's uh, just over. He's just over there. Okay. Do I take yeah, third. Third. Tom McPhail. Okay. Um, so uh, we'll give you one of these uh, these artworks at the conclusion of the conference, and we'll try and find you enough bubble wrap so you can take it on board a plane. Um, and fourth. Okay. I'll look up. Oh, another look up. Say, uh, oh, okay. So it's orange A23. With a soccer ball With stamp. a soccer ball. <laughs> um, uh, Arun Nilikatu. Wonderful. Go see Tim. Okay. You can take this. Thanks, Matt. I'm off the hook. Oh, uh, no, not yet. No. Oh. Who's going to take mine instead? Oh, no, we've already given it away. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Excellent. Hey, uh, oh. oh, cool. Thanks. Um, so, we are now going to embarrass Karen even a bit more because we have a question to answer How much did we raise? So, when we started this exercise, we thought that we might raise $9,000, which is enough to fund one outreachy intern, as well as conference travel and administration costs. Um, so, this is a number that I should have announced this morning. I was off by $100 or so. 11793 Australian dollars. Now, this was the first thing this morning. 
here is what happened when we added today's income. You can look over there as well. Yeah. So that's a bit more. Um, then we added in the money that we raised from selling surplus t-shirts. Uh, so now we're up to 14,000. Uh, you remember, uh, one moment, you remember there's, um, so 9,000 is the amount for one intern. We had two anonymous donation matches get in contact with us this morning during the keynote, which made that the number. And I think Kathy has something to tell us. So I don't think that's enough. <laughs> what do you reckon, council? So we're, well, we already did. <laughs> we're going to chip in seven grand as well. So... That is, that is extremely, extremely close to funding three interns. This is Oops, no, not yet. This is amazing. And now each and every one of you has to spread the word and get great applicants from this region for outreach because this is amazing. Great work, everybody. So great. Uh, Bruce, do you have something to tell us? Uh, yeah, so uh, about a month or so ago, Chris got in contact with us and he taught us all about this outreachy program and we were really excited by it. And we said, well, if they're going to be interning and they want to learn things about Linux and open source software, hopefully, why don't we uh, help them out by giving them a ticket to the next year's conference? So it was actually Chris's idea. I'm just mm. making it out to be mine. But... <laughs> Um, we thought we thought deliberated for about I think 30 seconds and we said yes straight up and also we said well if we're going to be giving tickets to the conference why not um, ask if LA will match that so as well as a seven thousand dollars a uh, ticket this isn't just for the intern this is also they have a mentor as well so a ticket mm. for the intern and the mentor to come to the conference we asked if LA would ma uh, buy a ticket for to go along with their uh, donation match, and they said yes. So, at the moment, we have a total of four tickets uh, for people in the outreachy program. Mm. And even just before coming up here on stage, we knew that you're getting close to a very in, uh, good figure. We thought if we do reach enough for three people, uh, we sat together and we said we will also provide two tickets for the third uh, third person as well. Mm. So, so next year, if we do this right, we will have six people from the Outreachy program here joining us. Thanks, Bruce. So, you have 10 minutes or so to email the team and tell us that you're going to be donating uh, the remaining, let's see, 1,659-ish dollars to, uh, to get to uh, get to three interns. I'm sure we can raise that in 10 minutes. So uh, send us an email and we'll try to find a way to take your money off you. Um, um, yeah, so um, we're really excited to, uh, to basically have, have blown away our fundraising goal and, uh, and help uh, give two, maybe three uh, women a fantastic introduction to, uh, to contributing to open source. Oh, hello. All right. In the spirit of what happened 2009 in Hobart for the Tasmanian devil, I'm pushing this up to 26,000. And I want everyone here to think about that and to meet over the air so that we can make this happen right now. No emails, right now. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. I think we might have three. Thanks, Karen. It's been so great to work with so you. <laughs> this room does weird things to people, <laughs> um, but, but we like it. Um, see, I, I, 26,000? 26, 26 and a half, 50. Okay. <laughs> Need to get to 27. 
20. Yeah, that'll do. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think that's our, that's our third intern. Well done, everyone. Amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Like, like I said, strange things happen when we fundraise in this room. Um, but, uh, but I'm, I'm deeply impressed and just completely blown away by, by the generosity of this, uh, of this community. Um, so I was reflecting on things uh, earlier today. Um, the seeds of this conference uh, started uh, with myself, uh, Craig McWhorter, and, uh, and a bunch of people from Taslug just after LinuxConf AU uh, 2013 in Canberra. Um, we, uh, we submitted our bid for this conference halfway through 2014, so we've been working on this for almost four years. Um, certainly for me personally, it's been a project that's, that's taken the best part of the last year to put together. And, uh, and seeing it all come together and seeing just the wonderful feedback that I've had from all of you and seeing all of you enjoying Hobart, enjoying our venue, enjoying our program has, has been a truly humbling experience. So uh, I'd like to finish this conference by thanking a whole bunch of people uh, who have helped make me and make my team look really, really good. Um, firstly, uh, Ryan Werner and uh, the, uh, the AV team at this conference, um, they have worked tirelessly... <laughs> so, uh, they've been responsible for making sure that uh, all our talks since Tuesday have been live streamed to the internet. Um, they're making sure that all of our videos go up online. Most of the conference is actually already available for you to watch. So if you've got a flight home tomorrow, you should like download a few of them and, uh, and catch up on talks you missed. Um, it's with thanks to, to Ryan and his team that we've actually been able to achieve uh, having the entire conference online so very, very quickly. Um, I've also spent a lot of time thanking uh, Steve Walsh and Arnett. Um, they really do enable a large amount of this conference to happen. So thanks to Stephen Arnett. Um, uh, Alfred, Kelly, Bernard, and all the staff from Rest Point who've uh, made sure that there's been plenty of food available, made sure that everybody at this, at this conference has been well catered for. They've been a pleasure to work with and, uh, and have helped us put on a, a truly exemplary Linux Conf AU, which is, uh, which is great. Um, now, I, I, have, I have a tendency to, to have a lot of thought bubbles that sometimes get executed into you know, things that show up at this conference. And invariably, it's uh, Hugh Blemings who is able to um, stare at me until I actually articulate my ideas well enough that it could pass muster with everyone else in this community. Uh, your sage advice has been absolutely wonderful this last year. And, uh, and I, I truly thankful, thank you for it. It's, uh, it's made this conference much better. Thanks, you. As I mentioned earlier, and as I think uh, Rusty and Pierre and the Rusty Wrench previous recipients said, uh, Michael Still and Michael Davies, along with the rest of the Linux Conf AU Papers Committee, work tirelessly to make sure that this conference attracts the absolute best people in the free software and open source communities. Um, without them, you know, we, could put, we could provide a venue, um, we, could, um, you know, we could put on some dinners, 
but we would not have any reason for you to come here and, uh, and, and enjoy this conference. So um, thank you, Michael, and, uh, and thanks to Michael Steele, who I assume will be watching the video of this at some point or something like that, um, for helping us put together such a wonderful program. Um, we, we certainly, you know, uh, certainly had a difficult task this year and you handled it absolutely brilliantly. Thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to cut away from my slides again. I need to update a slide I showed you earlier. Um, just a moment. Um, thanks to that mad rush of people again for uh, getting us to such a high fundraising goal. Um, if you want another photo of me so you can tweet it or whatever, um, I'll just stand here and be amazed. <laughs> right, back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, earlier this year, uh, I bribed a friend of mine with a meal at, at my home and a bottle of whiskey. And what we got for that was a, a bunch of uh, incredible artwork that, uh, that basically shows off the best of Tasmania. And um, it's, uh, it also gave us a, a new SVG version of Tuz, our 2009 mascot, again, our 2017 mascot. Uh, Tanya Walker uh, has basically made this conference look good. And so I really want to thank her for it, even though she's, uh, she's left already. Uh, thanks to the Linux Australia Council from, uh, from last year for um, supporting us and, uh, and making sure that you know, we were able to pay our bills correctly and providing us with all of the necessary institutional support for putting on this fantastic conference. Thank you to our safety and incident response team. Um, they've been working behind the scenes to make sure that issues that have been raised by attendees at this conference have been handled uh, swiftly and thoroughly. And um, it's really quite difficult emotional labor. And um, I deeply thank, um, thank all of these people for making, making this conference uh, go well. Thank you to our session chairs and to our volunteers. If you're a volunteer, come down here, stand up on stage. People, these people have given up a week and then some um, to uh, come here, take direction from us as organizers, and basically make this conference as awesome as it is. Um, you've all done an absolutely stellar effort. Um, you've made our attendees, you've catered to our attendees' needs, you've um, You've basically gone above and beyond to make this conference fantastic, and, uh, and I thank you all very, very deeply for it. Okay, um, let's see. I have a whole bunch more names to go through. <laughs> so, um, the, 
Putting on a conference like this is a really quite huge um, undertaking. Um, it involves a commitment of time that stretches along a, uh, well, in our case, up to four years. Um, so I'd like to thank some people who made a very huge contribution to our early stages of planning, who helped build us a foundation um, upon which we could build such a fantastic conference. Uh, Casey Farrell, who, sta um, who started off our sponsorship uh, liaison and also uh, basically helped land us um, sponsorship with the Tasmanian government. Uh, Michael Cordova, who helped us assemble our, um, our bid and finding and, and uh, basically doing the initial work with our venues. And uh, Matthew Durazio for helping prepare our, um, our initial uh, bid budget. Uh, so thanks to them, you've been wonderful. Okay. So those volunteers, those, those volunteers that you, those volunteers that you saw uh, on this stage uh, earlier knew what they needed to do because uh, Ducky was the person who organized them. Um, she's been fantastically energetic and has been working tirelessly to make sure that our volunteers have roles to do and know what they're doing. Ducky. Okay. Okay. Um, Scott Bragg, who has been, you're staying here, Ducky. Um, Scott Bragg, who has been our tireless sysadmin, uh, done lots of heavy lifting on the website and, al and has also been our, uh, our mini comps liaison. Uh, this year we uh, did things slightly differently with our mini comps. Uh, we made sure that all of the CFPs and such and scheduling has been facilitated through our conference management system and it's thanks to uh, Scott's tireless work that we uh, were able to do that and I think it's made, um, made a huge difference in the organization of this conference. So thanks to Scott. <laughs> Um, when I enumerate our sponsors every single morning and earlier, uh, it's really with thanks to Tim Sarong that, uh, that we have any sponsors at all. He's uh, written up agreements, um, negotiated heavily to make sure that we have sponsors, and it's with his tireless work that we've been able to put on such a high standard of conference because we have the money to do so. Tim. And to help make sure that that money makes sense to us and we don't spend too much of it, Jack Scott has been our wonderful treasurer for this year. <laughs> our conference would be nothing without the places in which we hold it and the person who has made sure that there have been venues for both of the conference uh, and the dinners and has made sure that you've actually been able to get to those places, uh, Josh Hesketh has been the person who's made that happen. Thank you, Joshua. And uh, ever since that bid that we put together, in, well, that we started considering in 2013, there has been one constant, and that's Craig McWhirter. Um, he's been a, uh, a wonderful offsider for these last few years. Come down here, Craig. He's been a wonderful offsider for these few years, and uh, without his, uh, his wise counsel and, and uh, well, and, and his, all of his assistance, um, I would not have uh, been able to, uh, to do as much as I have and the team would not have been able to do as much as the whole team have. Um, Craig hasn't been in Hobart for the vast majority of, uh, of, uh, of our planning but has still been such a key part of this conference team include, uh, before this, uh, this week and during this week. So uh, thank you, Craig. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you. 
to the uh, Linux Conf uh, AU 2017 team. Um, it has been such a pleasure working with all of you, and I think you've done, uh, done Hobart and this community proud. Um, thank you so much. I, yeah, I, what happens now? <laughs> um, see you all in Sydney next year, everyone. Thank you so much. We have some stuff, apparently. So on behalf of the speakers, and no doubt on behalf of the attendees, with help from Katie McLaughlin and co-conspirator Paris uh, over there, we have a handful of gifts for the organizing team. Uh, I will leave it to you oh. to open that. It's more paper! It's fragile, please don't break it. Um, T Tanya Walker did some oh God, amazing- I love bubble wrap. Amazing. The, the amazing Tuz and all the wonderful artwork that we had. Um, we, we couldn't just leave it just on placards. So what we've done is we've made some glass stained artwork of Tuz. And for all the uh, core team, <laughs> yes. And for all the core team, we have some wonderful uh, laser-etched laser laser etched, laser etched, uh, whiskey snifters with the different logos on them. And, of course, whiskey. Where's Josh gone? Oh. Jack? So, They're one last time. Names, apparently. Thank you so much. It's got your name on it. Um, and yours. Um, so, um, are we actually done now? Thank you all for coming. This has been such a... a such a, uh, a fantastic week. Uh, thank you all for making it so. Um, and we will all see you in Sydney next year. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs>